Today is July 17th, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 49. We're done with our summer break, and we're back to break down all the distracted drivers, L'Oreal's VR room, and delivery robots. This week, I'm broadcasting directly from Asana, because it's hot as hell, man. All right, Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my good friend and yours, Mr. Blake Arnstorf. Oh, hey, Nick. It is so good to be back. There How he is. How have you been, man? Oh, I've been well. You sound much better than you did last week. I must oh, say. goodness. Yeah, I apologize to everybody about that. I was sounding a little under the weather for sure. That's okay, man. We are here. We are back from our summer vacation. We are here to break down the stories. But first, I want to I want to talk to you, man, because it's been it's been two weeks since we last checked in, really. Yeah, I mean, it's been a hot minute for sure. There's been a lot going on. I mean, I was sick and now I've traveled up to San Francisco for a little while to visit with some family and whatnot what have you been up to well you mentioned hot man and i mentioned in the intro that i am directly broadcasting uh right from a sauna and i gotta give a little context to that so uh in the summer this room gets really hot here in the office and so uh you know and i can't i can't turn on any fans or else it'll 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 sound like this so, <laughs> Which everybody wants to hear exactly, on their podcast, Exactly, exactly. Right? So I am sacrificing my comfort to bring you guys an excellent show. No, I've been good. Uh, so I got to talk about this thing, man. So uh, are you familiar with, um, so the, the ah, it's like the PlayStation Plus. It's, it's kind of the equivalent of the Xbox games with gold. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so they give away free games every month and, and you know, I, I download them all and I don't, always get to try them out but um I, i've talked about the jackbox game jackbox games previously on the show right and this is those those games that kind of hijack your um the way that you interact with technology to sort of mask uh you don't have any time to mess around with technology and so you're all kind of focused on this one thing and it really is like a really cool group building thing right i've talked about that yeah, you've brought them up a f- at least once before. Uh, so did PS4 like release one with your Plus One membership this month? They did. They did, and they they actually came out with a new game, and it's it's like brand new, and they gave it out to everyone for free. It's called That's You. Now this one, it's a little bit different from the Jackbox games in that you have to download a separate app, and it connects via Wi-Fi. Uh, and it, it'll kind of search for the PlayStation on your Wi-Fi network. Now, I got So this is we're all, again we're always looking for these cool sort of human factors experience. Now, I have to say, this is not the most user friendly because you have to download an app, you have to sort of sign into the same Wi-Fi as the PlayStation. But, but let me tell you, man, if you get over that hurdle, this is one of the coolest uh, sort of tailored experiences i can i can describe so why is it so cool so okay it's very similar to the jackbox game jackbox games but because it's an app and you can give the app permissions to use your phone uh your camera and all that stuff so so basically it'll say like take a picture of this person doing a stupid pose right and you have to tell them like oh do the pose this way and you take a picture of them and then the picture then goes up on the screen now, likewise, you you take these pictures and then they they feed it back into your phone and they're like, okay, draw this person as a zombie, and you like, you know, you you literally draw over them as the zombie, and every, it's like a really personalized experience. And the way they handle multiple players, they'll uh, they'll kind of focus in on one person and be like, all right, this it's this person's turn, and the way they choose it is like the way we the way they chose me last night was. Uh, you know, who's who's the most likely to get us lost in the woods or, or you know, what, uh, if we got lost in the woods, whose fault would we all say it was? And everybody picked me. And so so then it, so then it was my turn. And they're like, all right, so let's ask, answer questions about Nick. And then, you know, uh, the next one, uh, everyone again picked me again, but it didn't go into my story. It asked another sort of probing question until everybody kind of agreed on that person. 
And then it went down that path and did it for another person. So it was it was a very tailored experience. It was very cool um, because it kind of it kind of made everybody feel like they all had their own moments. That sounds pretty awesome. I mean, all those social games are super super cool. And even though you had to like download an app and make sure on the same Wi Fi, it's still an awesome experience. Yeah. It's, and I that's, I that's pretty sounds like a great design. It is, and you know I have to say, like if you get over the upfront cost of downloading the app and actually the setup. It is uh, by far one of the best tailored experiences that I've had playing around with one of these social games uh, in a very long time. So I highly recommend it to any of our listeners who are on PlayStation. Uh, you can get it for free this month if you have PlayStation Plus. Uh, so, Blake, I'm going to have to have you over sometime to play these, man, because we keep talking about it. we we got to have like a date night. That sounds awesome, man, for sure. Maybe we'll throw some content up on social media for us doing it or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. All right, man. <laughs> so so, what's, well, Nick, what's so going like, on with you? I actually have come across a couple of interesting uses of chatbots recently because that was really big in a lot of like UX articles that I was reading and that I was coming across like just using different uh, customer help services. And sure. so I had written the idea off of like, okay, yeah, it's great to develop really nice algorithms that help you out like customer service wise but i never really thought what's the application of this beyond that um and there's a there's a language learning app i've been using for a couple of years uh it's we're not affiliated with them i just i like the design and it seems like they have a pretty good educational model it's called duolingo right right um and i logged in recently and it informed me that it had chatbots available i was like i don't even know what this could be but literally what they had done is they designed chatbots to tailor experiences you might have talking to real people so like ordering food at a restaurant going back and forth with a waiter or asking somebody directions in the street and it was it was cool little like 10 minute experiences with you going in between the chatbot but the the great part was like they do for all their learning their language learning stuff is you could either just type to the chatbot like it was actually just like an IM type of thing, or you could talk back and forth and it would record your voice and give you like pointers if you had made like accents wrong or said words wrong, that kind of stuff. So Man, it was just kind of a sweet use for a chatbot. That's pretty neat. You know, I used to speak a little bit of Spanish, and uh, you know, we um, we joked about this when Mia was on the show, but I mean, like to the reason I lost a lot of that ability was because I I lacked. So when I when I moved to Idaho, like I there was not a whole lot of Spanish speaking people there, and so like I lost my ability to speak it because I didn't use it. And it's great to hear that you can actually do that whole interaction, uh, just just through chatting with your phone, and that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's it's really good too because like I don't get to practice French very often at all. So this is another way just to, like strengthen it back up to a conversational level versus just like understanding like you were talking about. So yeah, it's cool. Can Shout you- out to Duolingo. Can you uh, can you give us a little sample of your French? Oh uh, no, parlez-vous français? Oh, what was that? <laughs> What'd you say? <laughs> I don't speak French. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. All right, so we were off the air for two we- two weeks. So <laughs> let's go ahead and jump into the news because uh, we got some stuff to catch up on. All right, so this is the part of the show all about human factors news. This could be anything from medical, transportation, psychology, artificial intelligence, whatever it is. As long as it pertains to the field of human factors, it's fair game. Blake, what do we got up first this week? All right. This week, first, we're hitting on some driving in cars. So MIT researchers are working on an algorithm to limit distractions when they can be the most dangerous. What if the things that you that kept you distracted inside your car worked with you? Like if they knew exactly when you needed to keep two eyes on the road and didn't beckon you to do the opposite. Getting them to do that is the goal of researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Age Lab and Touchstone Evaluations, a human factors engineering firm based in Michigan. Last week, the team released a paper that seeks to capture human attentional awareness in mathematical terms with an algorithm. They hope auto suppliers and designers will use this knowledge derived from this algorithm to build products that will aid drivers not in not killing themselves and others. This kind of research only becomes more important as vehicles with automated features hit the road in a gr- in greater numbers. And I know we talk about this a lot on the show, Nick, especially with uh, 
the expanse and automated vehicles or automated features inside of vehicles. But that last line is probably one of the most important here. I mean, the more you're going to have to figure out ways to keep people at least attenuated enough to jump back in the loop in an auto, right. in, especially in an automated vehicle. Right. So that's that's one of the biggest sort of uh, research areas right now is this whole human in the loop sort of uh, field where yeah, how do you interact with a system that's fully autonomous but may require the user to make some decisions? And I think it's a great approach that they're taking here by sort of embedding information about the vehicle and uh, using algorithms to kind of say when <clears throat> when does the human need to look uh, and why and how can we grab their attention and say, you know, they're on the phone and, and all of a sudden a notification comes down and says, look at the road. And then, you know, they're back in. Yeah, and I think the there's a big thing in the article that it talks about. It's not always going to be just about the technology, but also informing people that get into cars. Like, hey, I mean, you're we've added with the addition of the smartphone and even different features within an infotainment system. I mean, you're you're searching for content or media to listen to or hear um this is it's just an entirely different set of attentional problems that you're introducing in the car where it used to be just like the radio maybe distracting you or your passenger uh, so it'll be definitely a combination of informing people that the dangers of this because i don't think that people understand especially like texting and driving or trying to use your phone and driving how dangerous it is but also trying to advance the technology in ways that can kind of combat this. Right. And I think the most interesting part to me is probably this whole, how do you convey a complex sort of situation, right, in in something easily digestible to where the human will know exactly what to do when they get back in the loop or, or something or a verbal warning or whatever that says, uh, impact on your right side, right? So, like, then they are immediately uh, they're they're looking towards their right side. They know an impact is imminent, so they know how to react. So it's like, w- but is that enough? Is that what they're going for? How do like what sort what types of ways can we communicate with the drivers in order to convey that information? That's that's the interesting part to me, and that's I think what they're going for here. Yeah, I think that's definitely what the algorithm they want to intend to use, use it for at least. I mean, the th- the biggest thing that I'm seeing reading this and then thinking about it later is I think it's just going to have to be a major kind of paradigm shift in how we use mobile devices and cars or like the rules that apply to them. Because, I mean, we do have at least legislature that re- that police can enforce to like not have people using their phones. But I think even... Like once you're using something like Bluetooth, that once your phone enters a car, that all the functions can be accessed through voice or its entire, the only way it can be controlled is by the car knowing what's going on around you and then interacting back with the phone. So like what you were just talking about, let's say you got a, a text coming in, but you potentially have like an accident or impact on your right side, maybe delaying anybody being able to get notifications of a text or a phone call until they've dealt with what's gone out gone on outside the car. But I think that's going to require a lot better voice technology and interaction with the phone and kind of the car's own infotainment systems. Right. And then there's this whole aspect of, you know, what kind of driver is it? Is it a teen, an older person, someone with a heart condition? And how do you communicate information to them differing based on who's who's behind the wheel? It's It's a really complex problem, and I'm glad people are working on it because this is something that will definitely benefit us all someday. <laughs> yeah, definitely one of those down the road um, deals. Do we want to talk a little bit about like how they gathered some of this data? Because I thought it was interesting that they use like a longitudinal model for this. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to jump into that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it, this was really how they gathered a lot of this was through a government sponsored study of 2,600 drivers that allowed their cars to be rigged with cameras and sensors across six different states. And then the data was collected through over six years of time. And I guess like we, there was a, I don't know if anybody who's taken like an attention psychology class, probably in the last three to five years knows that a lot of papers have come out about attention and driving and distracted driving. Um, so Typically, what you'll see is researchers will look within a window of about five to six seconds prior to like a crash event 
to try and determine what the root cause is. Well, based off of what these researchers had done from this study, they were actually rewinding till about like 20 seconds prior to the event to get a better idea of all of the different distractions that would have led to your like basically an attention suck up to the actual event, which was kind of an important, I think, aspect when you look at attention that it was, it's not just always like the first, the, the five, 10 seconds of actions that happened before. I mean, it could be leading up to like, you've been messing with your phone a bunch and you do it more and more and more. So you're now losing your context of what space you're in. But that's kind of the basic gist of where the data for the algorithm is coming from. Yeah. I mean, they say here that it all comes down to eye glances. So I didn't see, did they have, uh, did they have eye tracking software in the vehicle? You know, it all, that's that's kind of a downfall of this one. All it says is cameras and sensors, and, but because they're talking about eye glances, either they had a camera that was focused on the driver. looking straight on the head, or but I doubt they had actually like eye tracking software. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They they do say that it all comes down to eye glances, and I'm sure that's how they are measuring distraction, right? So if they are, I, I mean, they could use that, but they can also measure, you know, what what's what's going on in their offhand while they're driving you know do they have a phone in it are they messing with the radio what's going on so but yeah this this is uh this is interesting work and i'm glad i'm glad work is being done on it do you have any other closing thoughts on this one blake oh i really don't i mean the only thing i i would throw out there just for anybody that's listening try and be as careful in the car as you can with this kind of stuff i mean messing around with downloading podcasts or Unless, changing music answering phones it's dangerous when you're driving especially here out, out here in california so oh, be yeah. careful yeah for sure be sure to download human factors cast before you get on the road guys all right so let's move there on we go. <laughs> let's move on to this next one i like this one yes i think this is my favorite story of the week all right so considering that new york city's hq of l'oreal has some impressive features including a nail salon and a terrace facing the hudson river it's all too easy to miss the virtual reality room Looks like an unassuming conference room after all. This L'Oreal Beauty Lab is packed with virtual reality glasses and installed with a VR screen that occupies a full floor to ceiling wall space. The company's 42 cosmetics, health, hair care, and skin care brands are encouraged to use the virtual reality room in order to drive efficiency and productivity when making decisions around product merchandising, packaging, and overall branding. These processes, which can take months from brainstorming to launch, can be turned around in a matter of weeks using the Beauty Lab. Thanks to the visuals of the virtual reality and 3D renderings, brands can save money and time on creating prototypes and recreating in-store demos. Now, I didn't really realize, and this is not, I don't know, not using their products or not really knowing, but in this case, L'Oreal is actually helping out indie brands that they later on purchase down the road, but initially are helping them out to rebrand some of their products using VR, which I thought was just a exceptional use case for why VR is definitely more useful outside of just the video game industry. Yes, yeah. So I'm always coming back to this sort of uh, how, how, I mean, you know, VR and video games is the obvious avenue uh, for those two. But yeah, I bring it up time and time again, the future of VR is not video games, it's other things. And this could almost be augmented reality, honestly. Are you looking at this picture at all? Have you seen this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one where you actually see the displays that they used in the, uh, what do you call it, the focus group? Right, yeah. So they're in this room and they got this full sort of, it's a dual projector system, but it, it presents a 3D image. And so uh, everyone wears these 3D glasses and it's like a, it's a, it's sort of an artificial shelf. And you kind of look at it and you can kind of focus group sort of, you know, what these packages look like and, and how you would, uh, what things you're attracted to on the shelf. And that information then feeds back into their design decisions. And then they can, they can sort of adjust it and put it back in. And this iterative process uh, through the use of VR uh, at least reduces the cost of this whole design process, which I just, I just find this whole loop interesting, right? It's well, I just think it's awesome that they were actually like, even before the VR, like they were basically making packaging mock-ups and doing live demos with consumers to try and like 
get them to see how how the product tested did it test well in this particular store that we're going to launch it in that kind of stuff but the fact that that would usually take at the very least about eight months to do from like brainstorming to launch and with this vr and 3d rendering is taking like three months uh, that's that's like an incredible just cut of time alone oh yeah yeah, and I, I love how in the original article they say uh, they wouldn't disclose how much it spent on the screen, but it was enough for visitors to be warned not to get too near the wall. <laughs> yeah, and I can see why, because, I mean, you can even see from this, like, the rendering picture that, that it, this is, like, a pretty serious piece of equipment for sure. Yeah, uh, like, this looks like, uh, this looks convincing. Like, this is some pretty high-definition projection going on here, and uh, I can imagine it looks pretty convincing when uh, you put on those those glasses and i mean it's nothing i like that they're calling it vr uh despite all the technology that they're using is is uh the stereoscopic sort of um polarized lenses that you'd find in like a real d 3d movie like that's yeah that's, yeah i think i think there is a little bit of confusion about them t- them calling it vr i i think there's a little bit ways to go before they get there because they're not actually using vr headsets but i i yeah. think from what I was getting from the article, at least when the product managers are doing some of the designs, I think that's where it initially starts before they get to the 3D rendering. Sure, and I, 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 it's a good point to sort of back up and say, what is virtual reality? This is a virtual environment that they are looking at, and I, I am 100% fine with calling this virtual reality. That's not my argument. My argument is that, um, that a lot of people think of VR as these headsets and they think of it as, you know, sophisticated technology, but really, you know, when you go to the movies, you're experiencing VR. It's just, it's just not locked to your, your, uh, your point of reference when you move your head. Right. So this is very similar to, yeah. to a, um, a non-tracking cave system. <laughs> a non-tracking cave system. Do you want to elaborate a little sure. bit? Sure. So a cave system is a uh, oh shoot, I forget the acronym, but it's essentially you know where you have four projectors uh, on on four walls, and you have some sort of motion tracking while you're in it. So your your perspective changes while you're inside this system. It's it's basically like VR without the headset, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard of that before. Yeah, and so that's what this is, just without the motion tracking which I, I think this is totally acceptable. And they're just using static images, or maybe they're not. I don't know. I From from the static image, it looks like it's a static image, but <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I mean, that was that was the only thing I thought. They could take it to the next level. It's like, okay, what, what can you do to help simulate some of the benefits of maybe having a headset on? Like like some of the companies we've talked about that I this would be a little more invasive for a focus group, but striking on so you actually have tactile feedback, like picking up things off the shelf or... Yeah, looking at them closely, um, but I feel like that's that's not too far in the future. With so many people using AR, and now we're seeing at least a virtual environment being used in a really big company. So it only speaks good for the tech. Well, uh, speaking of speaking good for the tech, you want to get into a an example of how not to get good at tech? Wow! Oh goodness! Yeah, bad this segue. Is how you right. don't treat your user base. That's for sure. Oh, man. Okay. So this this was pretty tough. But anyway, so Photo Bucket is facing some massive backlash on social media as it recently made a change to its terms of services that affected loads of users in the worst possible way. So near the end of June, the Denver-based company introduced a fee for serving images displayed on other sites, like an Amazon or eBay product listing, or even pictures in a forum post and on blogs. That came to a rude shock as many of Photo Bucket's 100 million, say it one more time, 100 million customers who found a notification in place of their images on other sites like you, like you can see in the original article. But here's the kicker. So users can't simply pay or upgrade to one of Photo Bucket's standard plans, which start at a reasonable $6 a month. Instead, their only option was to pony up a $400 fee for the annual subscription to the plus 500 plan this allows third which allows this third party hosting even its 40 dollars monthly fee wasn't available as an option for some reason so this isn't just a disservice to photo buckets users in the audience it's also a fine example of how you can lose customers and their goodwill 
The company is definitely well within its rights to charge people for a valuable service, but there's simply no excuse for failing to notify them adequately and offer a grace period along with affordable plans to accommodate as many people as possible. Now, Nick, there, there, I don't. I meant to try and look into like Photo Bucket's financials or what they'd been doing like in the news other than this because this just doesn't make any sense as a play unless something is really wrong in the company and they need the money. Right. Because that's such a giant barrier to entry, like $400 fee up front to, so you can host images. Like, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it makes sense for power users, but a lot of their users aren't power users. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, this is talking about people with, like, listings on eBay or blogs. This, I, I don't know. I thought this was kind of a kind of insane thing to do and then to only really make it known within the terms and services agreement right yeah i mean there's this whole customer service is user experience sort of philosophy and i subscribe to that i think user experience is, it encapsulates more than just your interface or you know more than just how you're interacting with the product itself it goes much deeper than that and it 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 spills into how you interact with the people and the infrastructure and everything else that goes along with the product, right? And, yeah, exactly. And this is just, yeah, I can't get over how sucky this is for these people. Like, I don't use PhotoBucket, but when I saw this, I, I had to post it because the the... The title alone, Photo Bucket's Ransom Demand, is a masterclass in how to not treat your users, right? And and that just to me spoke out and said, okay, well, yeah, it is it that this is the entire reason why I included it in today's show notes because I wanted to talk about customer service being user experience. Yeah, and I mean it it truly is. I think there's definitely a blend or at least in the processes where something like this happens, you've got to it somehow like accommodate your users because i totally agree that they're within their rights to do this and charge for about obviously what's a valuable service they've got over 100 million customers um and then i don't even know if that number changes when they factor in like why you're talking about power users but I, the biggest problem is just how they did it because in the article it also talks about that they had done some blog release as well, talking about that they were changing a little bit of their services, but didn't talk about this. This this changed in the pricing structure. Um, and to hide that in terms and services, like not to be too crude, but it feels like the South Park episode that they did about Apple, where it just like basically <laughs> takes takes oh, your yeah. soul or whatever. So it's, <laughs> I'm I, in I don't know, they could <laughs> Yes, exactly. But, oh god, uh, I, I don't know. I'd be interested to see. Like if how how much the numbers change because like four hundred dollars is that giant fee, um, but yeah the the one the, and the other thing is is that the and this makes me just not get why they treated their own customer base this way because there's free services out there that'll allow other allow their allow the customers from PhotoBucket to just migrate somewhere else. Right. Yeah. There's and there's plenty of other image hosting websites as well that offer services for free so i yeah yeah uh just a master class in how to not treat your users i can't there's like literally no other words for this i i just i it is one of those things that i just wanted to bring up because customer service is user experience and if you're out there working in the field and you have any say over how you know customer service runs uh just remember like it, it's important <laughs> Yeah, I mean this this will keep this can make or break like whether you keep customers or not, like how you design the processes and how you design releasing things like this, like changes in services. Yeah. All right. So I just wanna thank all of our friends at Gizmodo, the Next Web and Gadget and Wired for all of our news stories this week. As Blake was mentioning earlier, you can go uh and check out all these original articles. You can do that by going to any of our social media and you will be updated as we find them. All right, Blake, what do we got up next? All right, let's move to something a little more exciting here. So Ohio is now the fifth state in the U.S. to pass a law permitting the use of delivery robots on sidewalks and in, cross and in crosswalks statewide. The Ohio statute comes less than a week after Florida becoming a fourth state in the country to create a similar law. 
as well as Wisconsin, Idaho, and Virginia likewise have passed legislation to allow the use of delivery robots early this year. Ohio's new robot laws allow for machines to operate on sidewalks and crosswalks in the state, so long as they are less than 90 pounds and travel at speeds less than 10 miles per hour. The robots can rove unmanned, but a person is required to be in the loop remotely to take over operation in case anything goes awry. Now, this this is pretty cool that there's already four states that are taking this on. Five. But <laughs> now there's five. I have, yeah, now, now there's five. But I have like a little bit of a, a weird qualm with this story. Okay, what's your know, weird Dick, qualm? Give me your opinion first, and we'll, I'll break what I saw down. Okay, uh, I like this. I think that this is an interesting field of human factors because it's it's definitely sort of we have to learn how to interact with these robots that are doing jobs that we traditionally would do ourselves, right? Transporting food from one location to another, transporting anything from one location to a, to another. We are no longer interfacing with another human. We're interfacing with a robot that drops off something for us. So I, I felt like the fact that we are passing legislation acknowledges the fact that we are moving into this future where we are dealing with these autonomous vehicles in our everyday life, right? And they they even go to specify um, sort of the weight limitations, 90 pounds, and, and speed limitations. And that's for a reason. That's for our safety. That's for, you know, when we interact with these things, we don't want it to hurt us. We have to sort of uh, um, tackle them in a way that makes sense in terms of, uh, you know, how, how are we going to interact with these devices that are now roaming the world? And uh, what sort of limitations should we put on those devices for our greater good? I guess. So yeah. That, and I mean, they even make a, f- a pretty interesting notion in the article. I think it's a, like kind of an offhand joke more so than anything, but they, they are not planning to release these really in anywhere, but rural areas at first to, to, try and see what happens in terms of when they're introduced into a population, how do people react to them, but also because you have now you have to think about more people seeing them and vandalizing them or possibly stealing them, those kind of things. Right. I agree. Okay, so what's your qualm? I want to know. Uh, yeah, so I just thought it was really interesting that this is a permit only to one specific technology company. And the, the reason that they were able to, I guess, get these kinds of permits in these specific states where, like like it says in the article, just affiliations with people prior. Because th- this company is built, it was a startup branch from the Skype, the people who started Skype, and it's called Starship Technologies, which all the better. But I just, <laughs> I thought that when I saw the article that it was going to be my, kind of like a wide reaching thing that you're going to see a lot more uh, robotics be, being able to be put on the street. And I feel like this is limiting it down, uh, especially with the weight limit, because it even talks about in the article, there's a reason why that weight limit is a part of this particular permit. And that is because it's it's a lot less than its competitors that are actually out here in California. Ah. Um, so it, I just I was kind of disappointed only because it's it's limited to one company, although I mean, it's great to see them testing it out or getting plans together to do so. But I, I was hoping that it was more like a wide spanning thing. Like, okay, if your robots meet these specifications, let's, let's test them out in the world and see how they interact with people. Yeah. I, I yeah, I can see that. I, that is something that I kind of overlooked. Uh, but now that you say it, 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 it's really fishy and it just sounds like more BS politics to me. So, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really what it felt like. But uh, again, it's great that these many states, so five states already, are willing to try this out because it's only from putting them out there in the world that you see how people really react. I mean, we did this story months ago where I guess they put out the the meter made robot and some drunk guy assaulted it. Right? So oh, yeah, it's only doing things like that that you can actually understand how humans are going to interact with it and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um. Oh shoot! I just had a thought, and it's gone. Yeah, no, I I agree. I think the um, I think this is the gateway, though. This is kind of like the trial, right? If it works, then that's great, and we can start to move 
in a direction where we can maybe increase that weight limit depending on how it functions and how it works. So it'll be, yeah, it'll definitely yeah. be exciting to sort of see, you know, what's next. Where where yeah, are we going from th- here? I think what what's even better is um, the f- like this particular robot that Starship Tech builds is really specifically to the food delivery industry. But maybe with this test well test well, you can do it for delivery of different types of products, or maybe services that help out i don't know like elderly people getting them groceries and that kind of stuff oh yeah Um, i could see a really big tie-in with companies like amazon who's trying to break into some of the some of the food delivery uh, models and all that kind of stuff so i think there's a big future for it i agree i agree all right what do we have up next oh man we're just gonna call this one the weekly weird so (laughs) would you like a third 3d printed thumb i know i would and Danny Claude, a graduate student at Royal at the Royal College of Art in London, agrees with us. She created the third thumb, a 3D pr- printed prosthetic that straps onto your hand. So the thumb is a motorized and connected by cables to a bracelet. Pressure sensors underneath the wearer's feet connect to the thumb's motors via Bluetooth. So working the extra digit just requires you to press down with your foot. Claude said that she linked the thumb to the foot controls because with actions like driving, using a sewing machine, or playing piano, we already have practice completing tasks that require hands and feet to work together. I think that's a pretty good point. So if you check out the video, you can see the prototype is being used by people with the extra digit while playing cards, carrying wine glasses, cracking eggs, and even playing guitar. So overall, extra appendages feel like a move towards Orphan Black's neo Lucian. But the third thumb seems much less permanent and a lot less creepy. You know, <laughs> this thing looks pretty <laughs> crazy. And I thought, based on the story we had a couple weeks ago where you where we could, like, attach secondary set of arms that were controlled by feet, I, I was a little hesitant thinking that this would be really useful. But watching the guy play guitar with the prosthetic third, uh, second thumb was pretty awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, why is this human factors? Well, this is human factors to me because it is it is that new frontier of how do we interact with technology that enhances the way that we interact, right? We, there's, there's plenty of situations where you need, like, an extra finger to do something, right? Where, like, you're bringing in groceries and you have, like, a bag on each, each finger and you have, what, 12 bags or something. And so you just grab that that extra thumb and boom, you're good. But it also, it, it, it's, um, I had an interesting conversation the other day where, uh, augmented reality isn't necessarily just, you know, limited to vision. It could be audition. It could be tactile. It could be augmenting the way that you interact with the world. Right. So like, I, I, I just got a kick out of that. Uh, conversation in that you know could this be augmented reality you are <laughs> you are working with the world in a way that isn't normally possible so so it all comes back to human factors but yes i think this is uh awesome i want one let me tell you that i want one uh i'm also curious does it say anything about the strength of it because i feel like uh that'd be a big sort of um factor if you know if you're like grabbing uh, a weight or something to get a little bit more grip on it. You'd want, to yeah, know what that's the... actually a really good point because it, what it mentions with playing cards, wine glasses and cracking eggs, like those are some pretty fine kind of tactile strength movement. So it's, it's either got really good control or it doesn't have the ability to take too much weight. I don't know if the article actually specifies any kind of like, uh, restrictions re- with regard to that. Yeah. I'm looking now. I don't see anything, but, uh, but I definitely think this is this was a great choice. I, I like that it came from an art student, and we can relate it to uh, human factors. The the one thing that I really took away from it is that this is all well and good having like the third thumb, but I mean, looking at it, it looked like you could actually retrofit it to anybody with that may not have a thumb. Oh yeah, or, for or sure. lacking like some kind of specific digit. So that that was kind of a a, a good thing for. That I was thinking of just like the disability use of it because it, it's it's awesome having that like extra digit if you have all of yours. But what about kind of replacing something that is 
it's got some good pressure sensors it looks like and it's controlled by your feet so it's, right. it's not like relying on any kind of neurological data um directly yeah it could effectively work as a replacement prosthetic so yeah i i thought this one was a cool story uh worth bringing up if if anything i i want our listeners yeah, more, to go more 3d printing what's that more and more 3D printing. I think it's great. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could you could print this thing up. All right. I think uh I think we should move on to what's our last story and then we get into Reddit. Yes, indeed. All right, let's do All it. All right, man. So this one's also here to help you out. So do you deliberately avoid visiting friends who live in multi-story buildings without an elevator? I mean, no one would fault you having to climb even just a single flight of stairs is like being forced to work out against your will. But thanks to the engineers at Georgia Tech and Emory University, stairs might one day do all the hard work for you. In a paper paper published last week in PLOS One, the team details their energy recycling stairs, which store energy when you descend and then release it to make up the ascent to make the ascent easier on the way back up. As the stairs compress on your descent, the engineers have calculated they save around 26% of your energy you normally use to brace yourself as each foot makes contact. And on the way back up, the energy recycling stairs make it around 37% easier on the knee, making stairs, st- stairs ideal for people who are pregnant, dealing with mobility issues, or just simply out of shape. The stairs' unique mechanisms can be retrofitted to existing steps, so technology isn't just for new buildings necessarily. And installing them would be cheaper and require less space than an escalator or an elevator. There's no word on when the technology will be commercialized, but anyone living in an elevatorless building will certainly be hoping that it's as soon as possible. All right, Nick, let's let's talk about this a little bit. Let's break it down. Watching walk, watching the video of these kind of retrofitted stairs, I was hesitant that it was going to be are going to feel anything but very strange to walk on because it talks, they talk about how it's basically saving you energy by compressing on your descent. So for yes. anybody listening out there, think of like a stair, just basically collapsing a little bit as you walk down it. Yeah. And, uh, sort of popping up as you walk up it and yeah, exactly. So that's like the energy saved and transferred back to you. Right. Uh, so yes, uh, I I'm all for these interesting approaches. I feel like you have a good point where it might be kind of foreign to experience it uh, on the uh, uh, at the beginning, right? So it could be it could be weird, but imagine if these are everywhere and it's as simple as stepping on an escalator, right? I'm sure that when escalators first came out, people were kind of confused and didn't know exactly how to interact with them, but after they did it a couple times, they understood. And I feel like this is going to be a lot like that. I feel like if this te- technology were implemented, people would get used to it. And, uh, you know, over time, it would become second nature. Oh, you're definitely right. I, th- I think that the barrier to just, like, fearing, getting the learning curve down for it um, is the only really disadvantage. It just seemed like even the guys that were walking on it in the, I guess that had like basically look like CGI suits on measuring some of their probably kinetic energy in their legs. Uh, it looked like they had a, a difficult time kind of walking on them and not feeling a little weird, but they didn't have really more than a couple steps to take. Right. Um, yeah. it, but as far as like that, it's going to make it easier on your knees. I mean, they make great, um, they make great suggestions about how it can help pregnant women or if you have mobility issues make it easier for you to get up and down steps uh, i mean it, it seems like it'll definitely benefit people as a whole yeah i mean we've been talking about a lot of accessibility issues tonight i didn't even realize that we had a theme <laughs> yeah i didn't either that's pretty great uh okay do you have any other closing thoughts on this i think it's cool i think uh you know uh, i'm excited to see i, I want to try it i mean like i don't know if it's necessary, but I'm I'm willing to try it, and if it's if it's fairly inexpensive and are able to retrofit old stairs, I'm all for it. Yeah, let's see what let's see what happens. I hope that Georgia Tech and Emory maybe implement it in their campuses and like do a beta test that way. That'd be a really cool way to go. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, are you ready to check out what came from Reddit this week? 
Let's find out, man. All right. This is the show called It Came From Reddit. Well, that was that. <laughs> Let's not do that again. <laughs> that was a bad mistake. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm having too much fun with the audio board over here, guys. Hang on. Oh, man. Do, do, do I, I sound like Darth, Darth Vader? Vader? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you sound like a very echoey. Okay, all reader. right. This show went way off the rails. Let's let's bring it back. Let's switch gears and get all. Get, uh, okay, let me start again. Let's switch gears and get to the it Reddit section. This is the part of the show all where we talk about. Uh, we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community is talking about. Any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. Today's entry. Uh, was found on the user experience subreddit from Bankside. I'm going to read it Bankside. All right. And Bankside writes, internships in the U.S. Uh, I'm a 21-year-old designer living in Canada, and I'm starting to think about what I want to do next summer. I'm currently interning for a great but small digital agency. I'm thinking about trying to get a UX internship at a product company in, in the States. I have a good design network here, but it doesn't really extend to the U.S. I feel like sending your resume to a big tech company through official channels is useless, so I'm wondering how I should go about this. If anyone here has experience at product companies, I would love to hear your advice on what you look for in potential interns, what steps they should take to stand out, and who they should talk to. Just for a bit more background, I'm transitioning into UX from the brand side and have created work for... Kendrick Lamar, Google, J. Cole, and Vice. Okay, Blake. Help them out. <laughs> Man, you have worked for some heavy hitters, so I want to see your resume. So if you feel like it, send it to humanfactorscast at gmail.com, if that's the right email address. That, that is it. <laughs> it, it. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you worked for some really big names, so I'm, con- I'm personally a little bit confused that you don't think your network is really going to extend to the U.S., uh, just a note before I jump into your questions, I would go ahead and try sending your resume to big tech companies through official channels. I know it may feel useless, but in my experience, there are some companies that actually, that's the only way they want to find people. Um, I've had a couple of interviews where people are like, you have to go through the official channels regardless of the conversation we have. So it can't hurt just to spruce up your resume and throw it out. Um definitely since you're an intern and you've had a lot of good experience already it seems like at a small digital agency i would definitely put your resume online and when i say that don't just put resume items up there like really explain explain the process that you go through how you clearly think about problems that you've encountered and you could get really creative with these like four that you listen at the end especially like the two music artists google and vice i mean you could that would be awesome to see like how you thought about whatever problems you were doing with there. I'm sure there's some proprietary issues with that, but maybe you can, you know, talk to those previous employers or your current employer and say like, Hey, I want to be able to, I don't know, boost our company's cred by throwing some of this work that I've done on uh, a portfolio site. So make sure you do that. Um, Standing out that that's harder and harder (laughs) to do nowadays. I would say that you I, I don't know. This is from kind of what I've been dealing with in the last few months working with uh, UXPA LA is to really try and stand out on your social media, like creating content that's that's free and it's useful for other people. Like, I don't know, do maybe do like a little Periscope once a week on, I don't know, something you're, some new design process that you've come up with or new, some new design tool that you're using, things like that to try and bring value to the community as a whole. Um, and as far as who you should talk to, it, this this gets a little stickier for you if you really want to li- move into the states to work. But I would suggest, I mean, in Canada, I, there's got to be like UX meetup groups or professional organizations um, that exist in Canada. If not, start one yourself. Like I've, I, I know I've harped on that before, but there's no better way to like find mentors than to create a group where you can just get people together and brainstorm about user experience. Uh, I don't know. I think you have a lot going for you. So just get your stuff out there and kind of, I don't know, use your social media channels to help build your own brand. Cause you've got, if you've got branding experience, I think you've got a good shot at finding any job you really want in the U S. 
Yeah, so Blake, I want to echo a couple things that you said. So you mentioned that going through official channels is probably a good way to go, and I would agree with that. Uh, I I feel like that is a... I, I know several people who have gotten hired at, at some of the big ones, like Google, Apple, who have gone through the official channels and you know got interviews and got hired. There's, uh, there's a lot to be said for connections, though. And uh, one great way... So I'm going to go ahead and plug HFES. Uh, they always hold a career fair where you know you can come in and drop off your resume and they call you back and you have interviews right there on the spot and conferences like hfes and like these local events that you you told you know you should you said that you they should start up like um if there's not one already the great thing about these is that you get you get those connections through networking right so it's more it's more than just the applying for jobs it's about talking to people and uh sort of building these connections like it all comes down to putting yourself out there in a way that's going to be th- that's going to make you visible right and yeah like Blake's saying uh you, it sounds like you got you got a lot going for you and you're only 21 so i mean that's <laughs> that's great but i think if you yeah go to go to some of these conventions or not conventions that's that's my nerdy side coming out. <laughs> Go to some of these conferences. <laughs> Go to Comic Con next week and uh <laughs> Hockey UX oh stuff there. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. Uh no, yeah. Go to some of these conferences and um and uh make the connections there. Uh and uh you know what? I, I'm 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 gonna say it again. You should go to go to H F E S and and send in your resume and honestly, the job pool, there's there's a there's a whole lot of people there, but there's less people there than there are at the national scale. And so your chances of getting an interview are much higher. Just saying. All right, man. Do you have any other advice for Bankside? No, man. I think you've got a lot going for you. You just got to get more out there. And again, you're only 21. You got a lot of a lot of time to kind of figure it out. It sounds like they're on top of it, though, man. <laughs> like It really does. Much more on top of it than I would think at 21. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let's not even talk. Okay, all right, that's it for today, everyone. <laughs> Let us know what you think of it came from Reddit. Actually, hang on. It came from Reddit. Uh, did you like it? Did you hate it? Let us know. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that you think we may have missed, you can head on over to all our social media. Uh, head on to, over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Join the discussion on our SoundCloud. Hopefully, they don't go under anytime soon. Did you hear about that? <laughs> they. SoundCloud's not looking too great, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully that won't impact the podcast at all. Uh, you can also send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail dot com or leave us a voicemail at nine zero one six four six one four three two. That's nine zero one six four six one HFC. You can also support us on Patreon because we bring these things to you ad free because we love you at Patreon dot com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store or whatever your favorite podcast directory is, please review us. Make them good. We always appreciate those. Let's us know you're listening. Let's us know that you're engaged. And it's always nice to hear from you. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorff, thank you so much for helping me hold down the fort today and uh, come back from our summer vacation. <laughs> Where can our listeners find you if they want to follow along with you and all the juicy news stories that you uh, tweet out. Oh yeah, you guys can always find me on Don't Panic UX on Twitter. There you go. As for me, I've been your host Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. Oh, you know it depends. It depends. Got anything fun to say? It just it depends. It depends on which kind of L'Oreal product you like. Yeah! Virtual reality and stuff.